Okay, so let me start again. Hi, everyone. Welcome to your new Cosmo seminar. Thank you all for being here. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Alexa Lopez from the University of Central Lancashire in the UK. Um, a little background about Alexia is that um, she obtained her undergrad and master's at UCLan, and now she is a PhD student at the same institution. Um, let me say just some, uh, something quick about Alexia is that she's mainly interested in the research of observational cosmology and large scale structure. And also a fun fact about Alexia is that she featured in a BBC4 documentary in the UK with Professor Jim Al-Khalili <clears throat> discussing her dying arc. If you would like, um, I'll send you the link after the seminar. Um, today, uh, her, her seminar is titled A Dying Arc in the Sky. So thank you, Alexia, for accepting our invitation and please take it away when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and um, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's towards the end of my two months research trip in Chile now, um, and it's been wonderful so far. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a giant arc on the sky, uh, which is a large scale structure discovery that I made uh, like last year or so and published this in and then RAS, just the October gone. Um, so I'm fundamentally an observational cosmologist. So uh, feel free to interject in the middle with questions, thoughts, comments on a theoretical perspective. I'd really appreciate that. And hopefully you can help slow me down because otherwise this talk may only last two minutes. Uh, nervousness makes me talk less. So. Uh, this is just a quick background and overview of what I'll, I'll talk about. So obviously I won't, I won't go into the background much because we're all cosmologists here, so there's no need. Um, I'll talk about the method of um, observing large scale structure. I'll talk about the discovery of the giant arc, mention some statistics, observational properties, and finish with a summary. So as we're all aware, the, uh, the lambda Kodak matter model, the uh, standard model of cosmology, uh, relies upon this cosmological principle, which is uh, an assumption that our universe on large scales is homogeneous and isotropic. So this leads to a necessity to assess uh, using real data whether our universe really is homogeneous and isotropic. So for isotropy, we can look at the CMB max, and this proved so far very well that the universe is actually isotropic one part per 100,000. It's very, very good. Um, but assessing the homogeneity is a much bigger task. It requires really powerful telescopes, loads of telescope time, and there's pros and cons to both photometry and spectroscopy. Um, so the other thing with uh, observing large scale structures, obviously the further away you look, the older that these structures are that we're viewing them. So we, we need to know like, okay, so we're looking at this old structure, how will it look today? And we model how that will look using our standard model. So there's this tricky kind of circularity where we're assessing the standard model using the standard model. It's, uh, it's kind of funny. Um, so I'm going to be using the scale of homogeneity as 370 <laughs> mega parsec given by Yadav. So this means that above this scale, we should expect homogeneity. We should expect to observe the uh, matter distribution as homogeneous, representing a random point distribution or close to. Um, so this, this is just a few examples of some of the large scale structures that have already been observed to this day that exceed this scale of homogeneity, 370 megaparsec. The, the problem, or not necessarily the problem, but the, the problem that these large scale structures pose is that they raise this question mark on top of the cosmological principle. So for instance, one or two of these super large scale structures maybe could be understood with just a statistical fluke. But I mean, today there is a long list accumulating of these large scale structure discoveries. Um, okay. So the method I use for observing large scale structure is that of intervening magnesium two absorbers in the spectra of quasars, which is a mouthful. Um, so the method works by using these really bright background quasars to illuminate intervening matter between us, uh, the observer, and, and the quasar. So the schematic here, the, the stars are representing, the yellow stars are representing the quasars. They travel across the universe and 
they pass through the, the, the blue squiggles, which is the low ionized gas around galaxies and galaxy clusters. Um, and then we observe what is uh, absorption features in the quasars. So we're particularly interested in this magnesium-2 doublet feature, which is an example on this side here. And the magnesium-2 is known to trace star formation regions and be indicative of galaxies and galaxy clusters. And also, as you can see, it's super prominent. It's super obvious in, in the large and um, in this quite spectra of the quasars. And the other thing is the quasars are giving us the on-sky position and the wavelength that we measure the magnesium-2 is giving us the redshift. So we essentially can use this information to create a map of the large scale structure. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, so the data we use is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So originally we used the DR7, DR12 quasar database with around 120,000 quasars covering one third of the northern sky. And more recently, we've started using the DR16 data, uh, quasar database, which has almost a million quasars, again, covering the same SDS footprint, one third of the sky. And uh, then independent authors have taken these quasar databases and run their own pipelines to uh, locate where the magnesium two is in each of these spectra. And then we use these magnesium two catalogs to map the magnesium two, which is essentially trying to map the large scale structure. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you a figure of what that looks like in a moment. So, um, so during my MSc, I began testing this method of using magnesium two in the spectra of quasars to map the large scale structure. Uh, so what I did was I looked at already known and documented structures and clusters and mapped them in their magnesium two to see what they look like in comparison. And so in particular, at one point, I was looking at just a small SZ cluster, which is here on the left and the right. Um, I was looking at an SZ cluster and it, when I plotted this in the magnesium two, there was this really intriguing dense band of magnesium two absorbers just running across the central, but the field of view cut this off. So I investigated a little bit further. I increased the field of view. Um, and then I uh, serendipitously found the giant act. So uh, this here is the giant act. So I'll explain the figure. The gray splodges are the magnesium two absorbers smoothed out and flat fielded. And they're flat fielded against the dots in the background, which represent the quasars. Um, so this is to, because naturally the quasars are not necessarily perfectly homogenous. So we flat field the contours of the magnesium two absorbers to give an idea of uh, density or, or, or truer density uh, as that were. Because if you had a region of like, loads of quasars and then you had loads of magnesium two absorbers well you'd expect this because there's loads of quasars to see uh, the magnesium two and um, so this is a giant arc that extends approximately one gigaparsec scale to the present epoch and um, is at a redshift of 0.8 which means we're seeing this when the universe was only half of its present age and um, so we what we did next we we are seeing is for what range uh, not 0.8 plus or minus 0.06 yeah so it has a, a present epoch less of like 340 megaparsec so okay so this is so uh, can i ask a, can i ask a question as well yeah. on that <laughs> so is the can you say that uh, this uh, these dots or this uh, magnesium two is is a bias tracers of uh, a bias tracer of of quasar um, density? Um, so... in, in the sense that the sorry, go on. So in, in the sense that uh, wherever you see. It, it, a high density of uh, these, uh, you know, blobs of, of magnesium. That there should be a, a big number of of, of uh, quasars. This, this is what I mean by a bias tracer. Ah, uh, yeah, no. So this is this is not so much the case. What it, what it is is we 
we expect for a perfectly homogeneous background of quasars, we would still get the magnesium two would be representing the inhomogeneities or the large scale structure of the galaxies, the galaxy clusters, the actual matter that is being traced. However, in regions of overdense probes, and you also get over dense magnesium two absorbers, then you can't be so sure that the magnesium two absorbers are dense because of the large scale structure. Or okay, yeah, yeah, I absorbers. understand. Yeah, so it, it's yeah, a very okay, complicated okay. situation. But yeah. we, we like to think that most of the quasars are, I mean, we try to pick homogeneous areas, especially, you know, like survey in homogeneities and et cetera. Et cetera. And so this is some example spectra from the giant arc, actually. So the top row, uh, three selected quasar spectra, the full spectra, and then underneath is the zoomed in version where you can clearly see the magnesium two doublet feature. It's actually really impressive. It's so, so, uh, so, so obvious and big. And um, so we actually checked all 52 uh, quasar spectra to be certain that there was magnesium two detected in there because we are using other authors uh, databases, magnesium two databases. So we wanted to be certain we weren't detecting false positives. So we actually checked all the quasars in uh, the giant app, uh, 52 quasars, and we checked for all the magnesium two absorbers by eye. Um, so the next three slides will be the statistics. So we apply three different statistical tests for assessing the overdensity and the clustering within the field for the giant app. So the first test is uh, a minimal spanning tree type test. So it's a sequence of applying the single linkage hierarchical clustering and convex hull of member spheres. The single linkage hierarchical clustering is equivalent to the MST when separated at a specified linkage scale. This algorithm generates and locates structures within the data set. And then the convex hull of member spheres, this draws a unique volume around the structures identified and then assesses the overdensity by comparing the volume of the structure to a volume that would contain the same number of data points but having average density. And um, so the SLHC actually split the giant arc into two. So the black points here, and uh, so the, the red and the black points are generally what we we call the giant app. Okay, so this looks how we visually identified the giant. Now, the SLHC actually split the arc into two a really large portion containing the black points and a small portion containing the, the red points. And so this is, we think, we, we, we think that possibly this is highlighting the technical challenge of the magnesium two uh, method. So, what I mean to say is, okay, so on the sky, you can see that there's this overlap where the red point is actually within the black structure and the black point crosses over. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but so we, we suspect that, okay, for instance, if there was like one more quasar that could highlight one more magnesium two system, that this structure could be fully complete because it just, it looks so close. But anyways, we assessed the giant arc just based on the black points and just based on the black points, we got a 4.5 sigma significance for overdensity, an overdensity of 1.3 and a mass excess of 1.8 and centimeter 18 solar masses. So this is this is really great. And this is on the same uh, kind of scales as the huge large quasar group as well. If you know that structure, it's another, it's another big structure from 2013. Um, have I said anything about this slide? Yes, okay. Uh, so the next uh, statistical, oh, Sorry. The next uh, statistical analysis that we did was the power spectrum analysis. So this, this assesses the clustering within the field by assessing the coefficients of the Fourier series when applied to the data set. So the six high points on the left here is indicating the significant clustering within the field. And actually this is indicating clustering on 240 megaparsec scales. So we actually think this is finding the clustering along the width of the giant arc as opposed to along the length. So it's it seems to be finding the, the width along this scale, which would which would correlate to the giant arc. Uh, so we got a 4.8 sigma significance for this test. And the final test we did is the Quizzik and Edwards test. So if you haven't heard of this, it's uh, probably okay because this is a 
generally a medical research statistical analysis. So this test was uh, when I was I was thinking about this magnesium two, this quasar problem. Okay, the fact that the magnesium two is is there because of the quasars, and the quasars might have inhomogeneities, etc. So this test uh, is usually applied to assessing the significance or statistical clustering of medical type diseases uh, in unevenly distributed geographical populations. So I was like, oh, okay, this is very similar to, to what I'm doing. So uh, it's the case control K nearest neighbors algorithm. We applied it to the um, to the giant arc field and uh, found a 3.0 uh, sigma significance of cl clustering um, of cases next to cases. And this is the only test that can distinguish between the magnesium two absorbers and the quasars. So going forward, we want to use more tests like this because fundamentally applying statistics to just the magnesium two absorbers is problematic because it's it's going to be affected by the quasars and the quasar distribution, um, et cetera. So the next couple of slides are going to be visual impressions. So the statistics have not yet been applied. This is something we did. Uh, oh, sorry, I've just noted uh, noticed an error here. Lopez AL 21 submitted. It's 22 in Emma. So just ignore that slight mistake. Sorry. Um, so yeah, we did a visual impression of um, cross-correlating with other databases. So we looked at the DR16Q quasars in the same redshift slice as the magnesium two absorbers. So we plotted the quasars in blue on top of the magnesium two absorbers in gray. So this is the quasars in the field of the magnesium two absorbers, not the background one. So um, yeah, so visually what we found is that there seems to be uh, an agreement between the two contours where, where the gray contours were uh, uh, patterned out in the figure, the blue are following also so this can be two things. It's it can be indicative of some kind of an association of the quasars in the same field as the magnesium two, or it can be independent corroboration confirming the existence of these magnesium two absorbers. So going forward, doing this kind of work with other databases, especially the like Desi clusters and galaxies, this kind of thing is um, something we want to make more of. And um, another visual inspection we did. So we um we took the magnesium two absorbers in the giant app field and binned them into four different equivalent width bins. So the lightest blue point is representing the weakest magnesium two absorbers, and the darkest blue point is representing the strongest magnesium two point. And we plotted this uh, as a color coordinated figure. And so visually, again, what we seem to find is that the strong magnesium two absorbers tended to favor the left-hand side of the giant arc. And another another thing is that it seems that in, in the giant arc, the strong magnesium two absorbers seem to clump more together. And uh, there's like clumps in the in the tip and both to ends of the tips and in the middle, but like everywhere else, it seems to be a little bit more random. But this is something we need to apply statistics to to be certain of. But it's it just leads to something that could be interesting to look into. And um, the other thing is this. Okay, so I don't know if you noticed it in the other figures, but there's actually like a slight gap in the in the giant arc. And I'm going to mention now that. By the nature of the discovery, I was looking at an SZ cluster, uh, which by uh, by nature is a highly ionized environment. And the magnesium two occurs in low ionized environments. So we find it curious and interesting that there's where the SZ highly ionized environment is, there seems to be this hole. And then around this hole, there seems to be like these one, two, three, four, five strong magnesium two absorbers. It could just be a coincidence at this point, but it's something we found interesting and want to look into further. Um, in terms of other things, it's not actually showing here, but um, so I mentioned the left-hand, right-hand side preferences with strong and weak absorbers. There, but in addition, we actually looked at the redshift distribution. And on the left-hand side of the arc, the giant arc is much more confined within redshift. And it seems to spread out as it goes through the line, uh, through the app. So it's almost like on sky, the giant app is quite symmetrical, but in redshift distribution, it's not so. 
Um, so this, this could be indicating uh, something interesting, whether the redshift distribution and the distribution of equivalent widths and things like this, these are all things that we could find interesting to look into further. Maybe it can tell us something about our giant arc, uh, et cetera. Um, so understanding the physical relationship between magnesium two and the environment is an ongoing field of research. So as I've just mentioned in the previous slide, I'm mentioning equivalent widths or redshift distribution or these different things, because at the moment, the ongoing field of research is understanding magnesium two relating to physical environments. So is it affected by galaxy morphology and parameter, the orientation, all these different things. And the, there isn't actually a clear consensus at the moment. Um, it's it's ongoing and it's something we're interested in because the more the more this research develops, the more we can understand this research and apply it to our giant arc and maybe start to understand some physical things about the giant arc. Um, okay, so what does it mean? <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, there's a slight gap in the giant arc where originally there was an SZ cluster that's what led to the discovery. And there's also this circle of strong magnesium to absorb us. Are all those things related? We don't know. And um, there seems to be an association of the magnesium to absorbers with the quasars. So this could be indicative of uh, confirming the reality of the giant arc. Um, and there could be some association. This kind of work has been done previously. Um, the giant arc is the newest and one of the largest large scale structures in the accumulating set. So it's, I think it's like the fourth biggest in this set of um, large scale structures, which uh, as I mentioned before, as a statistical fluke, these large scale structures maybe could could be okay for our standard model. But what it feels like is happening is we're getting this big set of large scale structure discoveries, and it feels like there's this little question mark over the cosmological principle. Is it still valid to assume this scale of homogeneity given the the, the discoveries of large scale structures that are all made by independent authors? Um, the last thing to mention as well, uh, just as a, as a little skeptical thing, the giant arc seems to have some similarities to what you've probably already heard of the Sloan Great Wall, except the Sloan Great Wall is in the near redshift universe and the giant arc is at 0.8, which is when the universe is half the present age. So, oh, I mean, we wonder, we wonder, does the giant arc evolve into something like the Sloan Great, Great Wall? And um, the giant arc is twice the size of the Sloan Great Wall. So can it evolve into something like this and, and be a precursor of, of something like the Sloan Great Wall? Um, questions that we don't have answers to yet. Um, so what I plan to do for the rest of my PhD. Um, so we have this, as I've already mentioned, huge catalog of magnesium to absorbers from independent authors. So, we plan to apply the statistics that we apply to the giant app. We plan to apply them a priori to the whole database. So we can determine whether there's any other structures out there, what the structure of this, um, you know, essentially try to map this section of the universe, this, uh, this redshift distribution is assess the large scale structure of that, of that region using the magnesium to pass one. Uh, I've mentioned the technical challenges to the magnesium to method. So given that the uh, the images that I showed previously, uh, I don't know. Yeah, okay, so this image, as I mentioned, the gray contours are smooth and flat fielded. So I have this idea of applying a filament finder type technique. So something similar to, I don't know, like fingerprints or things like that, that would assess the pixels. So the pixels not only have uh, like on off, but they also have like a density to them, whether they're sh strongly dense or, 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 or not so strongly dense. Um, so it would be interesting to be able to apply a filament finder type technique um, to these to these magnesium two uh, images, rather than looking at the magnesium two points, which without the information of the quasars, you don't actually know whether these magnesium two points are occurring because of dense population of quasars or because that's what the large scale structure is. Um, independent corroboration with other data. So this is, you know, as I mentioned with the quasars, but also going forward, the DESI cluster database, um, and also maybe looking at some available images with pen styles or something like that. 
Um, and hopefully this kind of independent collaboration can help understand maybe the environment of the giant ad um, understand how something like this, I mean, how something like this forms, how something like this evolves, what's going on in the environment of the giant ad. These are all interesting things that we'd, we'd like to know about. Um, did I, I did click? Is it not clicking? Did it click? It does not seem to want to move to my summary slide. I don't know why. <laughs> it's not going at all. <laughs> okay, no, let me. Does it mean, you know, Linux things? <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you unplug it, then plug it again. I just have one more slide. It's just my summary slide. <laughs> no problem. It's work now. Maybe just escape. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Even the time stopped. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the laptop crashed. I have a habit of this. I actually broke my laptop last week, which is why I'm using somebody else's. And it looks like I broke theirs too. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, I can just mention the summary slide. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the summary. So look, the summary is uh, I found a big structure that extends over one gigaparsec uh, at a redshift of 0.8, which is when the universe is only half its present age. I don't know why I'm still looking up there. And we applied three different statistical tests to assess the significance of the over density and the clustering, and these are all over three sigma significance. Um, this, uh, this, this structure uh, potentially challenges or not, not challenges and it's not like an angry thing. It's like maybe a question mark over the cosmological principle. Um, if it's still valid with this accumulating set of large scale structures. And um, we found an association, still keep looking at that. I found an association of the magnesium two absorbers with the quasars, which could indicate something um, about confirming the reality of this giant arc. And um, I also looked into the observational properties and found that the giant arc was, um, although it looks symmetrical on the sky, it doesn't seem to be symmetrical in redshift distribution or also the equivalent width distribution. So that's all for my talk. Sorry about the missing last slide. There was actually a really nice gif of my giant arc moving in three dimensions, but never mind. Um, thank you for my talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, thank you, Alexia, for your great talk. I'm sorry about the. No, it's okay. You see, this would rotate, you see. Maybe that's what broke it. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. So if anyone has them, please go ahead. The Zoom too. Bearing in mind, unfortunately, I can't scroll to the slide that you want to ask a question about because it's not working. So we have a uh, yes, uh, thank you, Alexia, for the nice talk. Um, do you hear me well? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Well. Uh, so I want to ask you about the cosmological principle. In uh, I want to understand better in which way uh, the existence of these large um, clusters challenge the cosmological principle. Is it because uh, we have a theoretical expectation that uh, they should not be there or is it because when we compare with uh, simulations, we don't find them or uh, or what? I mean, what is the origin of the expectation that uh, these large, I mean, we, we should not find clusters um, of quasars in this case, larger than something. So uh, this, is, this is something that uh, has been, I mean, it has had ongoing work uh, since the start of this idea of, okay, a homogeneous universe. The cosmological principle uh, is an assumption of our homogeneous and isotropic universe. And so this, this scale is based on what you would expect the, the, the homogeneity scale to be. So the scale that I used 370 is from the paper from Yadav. Um, and he basically 
determines how homogeneous or at what scale the universe should start to be homogeneous. So this was using uh, like point random point distribution uh, situation, but possibly uh, I'll find the paper and I can, I can point you towards the right place so you can read that also. Um, but it's the fact that we we say that above a certain scale, we should not expect to find these large scale structures. Yet above this scale, we are finding lots of these structures. And people argue, okay, well, we found the structure. It's, it's okay. It still fits within the statistical analysis. It's an outlier. It's okay. But this list is accumulating. So it's either that we need to adapt this cosmological principle, okay, so this scale idea of 370 megaparsec obviously can't work so well if there's lots of structures that are exceeding the size. So it's, it's this is why I say a little question mark over the over the cosmological principle. Is it is it that we just need to tweak it and allow for these structures to exist? And in terms of simulations, can we can we? I'm not a simulation person, so this is not my field of expertise. But can the uh, can the simulations allow for these uh, multiple large scale structures to be existing in the small bit of the universe that we're actually looking at? Because in reality. You know, there's not the 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 surveys are always small or like large scale, but like maybe like little bits. So in terms of the entire universe, it's, it'll be uh, different. So yeah, will the simulations allow for things like this? And do we need to tweak the cosmological principle to allow for these structures to exist? I hope that answers your question. Yes, pretty much. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks for your question. Do you have more questions? You said that this was a serendipity discovery, right? So essentially, you were spotted by I. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to find a structure in a totally automatic way? Yes, actually. So uh, I. I plan to look at all the I plan to look at the full magnesium two days data set. Um and so I did like a preliminary looking at the full data set. And at this point I hadn't automated the the, the statistics. So it was like a couple of weeks of like every so often I'd change the redshift slice, look at that redshift slice, save the data, go back and do some work and then keep repeating this until I had uh like I think between like 10 or 20 redshift slices that were covering like a big part of the SDS footprint. And I looked in each of those files. So this way, what I did was I started off at the lowest redshift point that can be observed with magnesium two and just picked a arbitrary plus or minus 0.05, like a skinny slice and just looked through all of these redshift slices. And even just doing it in this automated way, in this preliminary automated way, the I was looking through all of the files and the giant app was still detected, even though the redshift slice was not exactly where it's most peaked. So the giant app was found, it was still the, the highest significant overdense structure found in that field. And this was not by picking, uh, this was not by picking the redshift slice. But in terms of any other ways of finding the giant app, I I've not done anything other than that. So, um, yeah. Any more questions? So if not, um, let's thank again Alexia for her great presentation. Thank you everyone for coming today, um, both in person and online. And for those of you uh, who are here, we're having the pizzas in a couple of minutes. They are just arriving and we're going to have them upstairs. Oh, that's it. Uh, <laughs> upstairs, we're going to have them upstairs. <laughs> Bye everyone online. Bye everyone online. <laughs>